Armstrong. Welcome to the inaugural episode of the Self and Society podcast, where we explore what it means to flourish as an individual in a, in a community. Music by Jared Smith, a Colorado composer. See jsclassical.com. If you like the show, please help support it at ariarmstrong.com slash donate. We're here with Robert, Dr. Robert Zubrin. Thanks for being with me today. Thanks for inviting me. So you are the head of the Mars Society. You're also head of Pioneer Astronautics, where we're sitting right here today. You wrote the case for, case for Mars back in 96, some time ago, which I read some years ago, and it was very influential on my thinking in terms of how we should approach space. And that actually got a forward by Arthur C. Clarke, so that's pretty impressive. And you've written numerous other books about Mars and articles and technical papers about Mars. A couple of years ago, you also came out with Emergence of Despair, which is a book on what you call anti-humanist version of environmentalism. And uh, most recently just came out, The Case for Space, which I love the book. I thought it was a beautiful book. The, a note for our listeners, it is a lengthy book with 14 densely packed chapters. So we're only going to be able to touch the surface of it today. And there's going to be a lot that you're going to have to wait for till you get the book for yourself. I wanted to start off just with a moment of biography, if you don't mind. So we know basically what you're doing now. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? How did you get interested in space? Well, I, I was born in Brooklyn, and I spent um, the first part of my childhood there. I went to high school on Long Island and um, college in upstate New York. Um, but I first became interested in space as a child. I, I was five when Sputnik flew. And um, while to the adults, uh, Sputnik may have been a terrifying event, to me it was exhilarating. I, I was already reading science fiction. I was an early reader. And uh, what Sputnik said to me was that the stories I was reading about the spacefaring future were going to be true. And I wanted to be part of it. I was all in. And I was a Sputnik kid. And, um, you know, launched rockets. My father got me a telescope. I did drawings of the moon through the eyepiece. Uh, you know, when I was in fourth grade, uh, Kennedy made a speech committing us to go to the moon, saw it on TV, um, and I learned all the science I could. We were going to the moon by 1970, Mars by 1980, Alpha Centauri by the year 2000. I wanted to be part of that. And of course, uh, we did realize um, the first part of that program. We did make it to the moon before 1970, um, but the rest collapsed. And, um, and when I was in college, and so we weren't going to Mars. We weren't going anywhere. And um, the real world got to me and said, oh, it's all right to think of being a space explorer when you're 12, but here you are, you're going to have a trade. You need a trade. So I became a science teacher, and I did that for about seven years. But at a certain point, I said to myself, this isn't what I signed up for. It's a noble profession to be sure. It's useful, but this isn't what I signed up for. So I decided to go to graduate school, and I became an engineer. And a nuclear engineer, right? Yes, initially a nuclear engineer because um, I thought that the key breakthrough that would be made in the last part of the 20th century was controlled fusion. And uh, so I entered the nuclear engineering department at the University of Washington, Seattle, to study uh, fusion. And I did, and I got a master's in that area, and I did some work at Los Alamos. And um, But while I was there, there was another group of people of my own generation who basically it had an analogous experience, and they had started this thing called the Mars Underground, and they were holding conferences in Boulder entitled The Case for Mars, and I heard about it after about the second one, The Case for Mars 2, which was in 84, and, you know, they said, we, you know, the space is not just about reconnaissance satellites and weather satellites. Space is about a human future, in, in, and so I went to the third Case for Mars conference, which was in Boulder in 87. And Carl Sagan was there, and Thomas Paine was there, who had been the administrator of NASA when we landed on the moon, and so forth. And it was a tremendous thing, all these people presenting papers about how we could go to Mars as a multidisciplinary uh, thing involving propulsion and life support and social factors and trajectories and 
exploration technologies. And, you know, it was very attractive to me. And at the same time, the fusion program had been retrenching, um, increasingly becoming narrow in scope. And um, so I kind of switched, and I got a second master's in aeronautics and astronautics, and I ended up getting a doctorate that was interdisciplinary between uh, astronautics and nuclear. And, um, and I also got a job at Martin Marietta uh, doing preliminary design of interplanetary missions, including you and Mars missions. And it was there that I came up with the Mars Direct Plan, um, which caused quite a stir. And um, because it was, you know, looked at in the spring of 1990, if we adopted this approach, this was humans to Mars by 1999. And it really threw down the gauntlet of, you know, is this a mission or is it a vision? If it's a mission, you can do it. Here's how you can do it. And it became quite controversial, a lot of support, a lot of opposition, a lot of flack, but it made the headlines. It moved NASA's thinking on it. It broke press in Newsweek, and then I got a call from a literary agent and said, you have a book here, write it, we'll get it published. And then she did, and The Case for Mars uh, became a bestseller in 96, and I got 4,000 letters uh, from people all over the world saying all sorts of stuff, but what they were ultimately saying was, how do we make this happen? And I, along with some of the people in the old Mars Underground, said it looked at this outpouring of talent. It was all kinds of people. Yes, engineers from JPL and astronauts, but also firemen from Saskatoon and opera directors from New York City and bankers in Paris and 12-year-old kids in Poland and, you know, widows of Congressional Medal of Honor winners in World War II. And, and it was astonishing. And uh, we pulled these people together. We'd have a force that could possibly make humans to Mars happen. And we held the founding convention of the Mars Society in Boulder in 98. 700 people showed up, and the Mars Society was off to the races. That's, that's a great story. Mm -hmm. And now we're in Pioneer Astronautics. What kind of projects have you got going now? Well, Pioneer Astronautics is uh, an R&D company that I founded in 96. That is, I worked at Martin until 96, and then I left to start my own outfit. And uh, we do um, R&D uh, on contract, mostly for NASA, some for the Air Force, even the Department of Energy, uh, and some for some private uh, corporations. Um, we've done over 70 contracts for NASA um, in covering a wide spectrum of areas, but the largest single area, the majority, uh, more than half, have uh, been in the area of what they call in situ resource utilization. Um, um, I would prefer it be called in situ resource creation um, because I don't think there is any such thing as a natural resource. There's only natural raw materials. It is human resourcefulness that turns raw materials into resources. But anyway, under whatever name you give it, it's taking local materials that can be found on Mars or the moon or asteroids and turning them into resources for space flight, space development. Um, so the, the, you know, the one that I had specified as critical in the Mars Direct Plan was the ability to make uh, propellants on the surface of Mars. And from the atmosphere. From the atmosphere. And now it's apparent there's also water on Mars. So between water and carbon dioxide, you can make fuel and oxygen, you, which is the complete propellant combination. And, of course, you can also grow food. You can make plastics and synthetic fibers. And you can do a whole bunch of other things. Um, and the ability to take the materials that are present in an environment and turn them into resources determines whether that environment is habitable for you or whether you're just a visitor. So my understanding is you've actually built machines to demonstrate the chemistry of some of these processes. Is that... Yes, sort of we have. Uh, we have built uh, machines um, that develop uh, demonstrate the ability to make uh, fuel and oxygen uh, on Mars and oxygen on the moon and also metals um, and, and some other things. Uh, we have built a complete end-to-end -end system that could make fuel and oxygen on Mars on the scale of the Mars sample return mission and we have developed subsystems of it uh, and demonstrated them uh, individually on the scale of human Mars missions. 
So I want to get back to the Mars plan in a minute. But first, you have this nice section in your book that lays out a vision of where we could be in the next few decades, the next 50 years in space. So I thought it'd be nice to just let you give the overview of where we could be if we take this seriously in, in the next 50 years. All right. Well, I'll read this little section. This is towards the end of the book. Um, it's on page 317. Uh, and it's entitled The Year 2069. And it says, As I write these lines, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing is coming into view. Over the past 50 years, our robotic planetary program has performed epic deeds of exploration while our human spaceflight effort has stagnated. But now, with the entrepreneurial space launch revolution, we are poised to break out into the solar system. If we seize this opportunity, where might we be 50 years hence? Here is my vision of where we could be. We will have fusion power and open sea mariculture and will no longer be living in fear of climate change, resource exhaustion, or each other. We will be a cosmopolitan civilization able to travel the globe freely through suborbital space in less than an hour so that nearly everyone will have friends in every land. We will have research laboratories, industries, and hotels on orbit. We will have scientific bases, astronomical interferometers, and helium-3 mines on the moon. There will be operational lunar skyhooks enabling transport all over the moon and the cheap lifting of propellant to lunar orbit to support exploration missions to the outer solar system. We will have city-states on Mars, vibrant optimistic centers, of invention sporting lively and novel cultures with many casting off the chains of tradition to strike out new paths to show the way to a better future. We will have mining and settlement outfits finding their way into the main asteroid belt and exploration expeditions to the outer solar system to test the means by which we might access its enormous energy resources for the human future. We will have grand observatories floating in free space that will be making magnificent discoveries in physics and cosmology, mapping the planets of millions of stars, and finding other worlds filled with life and intelligence. We will be learning the truth about the nature of the universe and life's role in it, and preparing our first interstellar spaceships to journey forth and find our place among the stars. That's a nice passage, and there's a lot, there's a lot packed into there. So, okay, so switching back to the Mars plan, that's your, that's your grand vision for the next 50 years. Of course, you have an even more grand vision for the 50 years after that or the 100 years after that going beyond the inner planets and even beyond the solar system possibly at some point. But I, don't, I'm, I think that we want to keep it to the inner solar system maybe for today, um, which is a grand vision in and of itself. So your Mars Direct vision plan, what, I, what really appealed to me as a non-scientist about that is just the idea that you could go light, live off the land, which you've already talked a bit about that, and actually set up a, f a permanent human settlement on Mars as opposed to just sending people for a few days or a few weeks or even a few months and then bringing them back and then it's barren again. Um, so I, I guess people can read this book or for more detail read the previous book about Mars. Go ahead. But, okay, I'll, I'll explain the Mars Direct yeah, Plan. Yeah, okay, great. Um, the idea is to take the Mars mission out of the science fiction future of building giant interplanetary spaceships at floating spaceports uh, and instead put it in our world of brass tacks engineering, okay, because, you know, we are much closer today, technically, to being able to send humans to Mars than we were to being able to send men to the moon in 1961, and we were there eight years later. So what's the cut to the chase, no nonsense way to actually get to Mars? Okay, you know, how do we take this from a vision and turn it into a mission? Well, this is what you do. You need a heavy lift booster. Now, the SLS, if it had a proper upper stage, which unfortunately it doesn't, uh, would serve. Um, the uh, SpaceX Starship, which is a fully reusable heavy lift booster, if once it becomes operational, it would serve and it would be a lot cheaper. Um, or, frankly, if you had the Saturn V, it would do the job. But you need two launches of your heavy lift booster. The first shoots off to Mars, an Earth return vehicle with no one in it. And, um, okay, there's a painting of it over here. I don't know if your camera can see it, but 
It's also in the book. Um, Earth return vehicle is a little rocket ship for flying back from Mars to Earth. It lands on Mars, okay, and you either bring some hydrogen with you to Mars or you have a rover that can extract Martian water from ice and you get your hydrogen from there, but whether you bring the hydrogen or get it from water, um, you react that with carbon dioxide, which is 95% of the Martian atmosphere, to produce a large supply of methane oxygen rocket propellant. So now you've got a fully fueled Earth return vehicle sitting waiting for you on Mars. And once that is done, at the next launch window, you launch the Habitat spacecraft to Mars. And um, I envision this as being perhaps tuna can shaped uh, uh, object maybe eight meters in diameter, six meters tall, so you got two decks each with three meters of ceiling height, and um, a crew of four flies out to Mars, lands near the Earth return vehicle, you land it on Mars, you use that as your base on Mars to explore the locality, you operate on Mars for about a year and a half, at the end of that time, you get in the Earth return vehicle, you fly back to Earth. You leave your habitat behind on Mars, so each time you do this, you add another habitat to the base, and before you know it, you've got the beginning of the first human settlement on a new world. There, there's nothing in this that's fundamentally beyond our technology. This is a lower order challenge than Apollo was for its time, and for us to say this is beyond us is basically saying we've become less than the kind of people we used to be, which is something that this country cannot afford. Uh, so I say we take it on. Well, it's kind of odd because the first moon landing was actually before I was born, and so I don't actually have any memory of the moon landings. I was too young. And so really, me to, for me, space is history, history videos, like seeing the great Apollo 11 video that's recently out, or the uh, Mars movie, the Martian movie, the fiction movie um, by Andy Weir, who I understand has some inspiration from you. And so to me, Mars... I didn't get the chance to have Mars be such a... We had the rovers, yes. We had the space shuttle, which my big memory of space is watching the space shuttle, shuttle blow up while we were all in school watching it. So it's kind of sad in a way that I don't have... The, people my age and younger don't really have the memories that you have of the vibrant, active people in space missions. And so I'm glad that you can well, carry I, the vision forward for us. Well, yeah. Um, I guess... What we have, the people of my generation or older, is the memory of a space program that could accomplish great things and do it within a short amount of time. Um, the, the, that is, do it in real time. And uh, that could take on a great goal and not have it just be sizzle, but have it also be the stake. Um, you know, that when we say we're going to the moon, this isn't a vision for the future, but this is something that we are actually going to do. Uh, and, uh, now right now, um, precisely because the, um, NASA has dropped the ball, um, um, a vacuum has been created, um, in which entrepreneurs have stepped forward. Okay, this would have been unthinkable in the 60s. No one was praying for entrepreneurial savior for our space program in the 1960s. Okay, we were doing it, okay. But now, first of all, there's a broad understanding that a positive human future requires human expansion into space. And, well, since the 90s, people have been stepping forward saying, okay, well, we've got to do this. And finally, in 2001... Uh, one such person was recruited to the cause who uh, actually had the resources to uh, really do it. And, of course, that was Elon Musk. And then, of course, Bezos and, and Richard Branson and so forth. Um, and what Musk has done, and this is discussed a lot in the book, is he has not merely successfully created a number of very useful space flight systems. He has proven a deeper point which is that it is possible for a well-led entrepreneurial organization to do things that previously it was thought that only the governments of major powers could do. And not only that, do them in one-third the time at one-tenth the cost. And even do things that they had deemed impossible to do, such as reusable launch vehicles that instead of crashing into the ocean, fly back to the launch pad and land there so they can be reused again. I mean, here we are. We've been going into space for 60 years, and... Uh, 
that had never happened, okay? And now it had happened. And, and done by an outfit which, admittedly, some resources, uh, but a tiny fraction of the resources at NASA's disposal. And, the, the, and as a result of having made this proof, Musk has initiated an entrepreneurial space race. There's been other emulators, uh, which you might say are of his type, that is of uh, billionaires and so forth, who've decided that they want to do something more with their lives than uh, take expensive vacations to the Galapagos Islands. Uh, and, and, and the, the, the um, but even proving it to the point that working engineers, middle class people with uh, strong technical backgrounds have been able to find investors willing to launch spaceflight companies. So you have companies like Vector Space and Firefly and Rocket Lab. Okay, and here's Rocket Lab. That's from New Zealand. New Zealand doesn't even have a space program. The fact that this has become entrepreneurial has dropped the national barrier on this. Any person from any country can participate in space exploration now. Um, because e e every country can play. Firefly is largely Ukrainian at this point. Uh, the the, the, the K-Vector is American, but um, I know of at least five startups in China that have gotten investment uh, and are developing reusable launch vehicles. Um, and, uh, and then in addition to those, we have people with entrepreneurial backgrounds developing spacecraft, okay? as well as space technologies of different kinds. So the launchers, the spacecraft, the space systems, okay, and then it's being done on a competitive basis, not on a cost plus contracting basis, which is, uh, drives the price down. And the cheaper space launch gets, the more space launches there's going to be, which means more innovations are going to be tried. And the cheaper space launch gets, the less conservative the spacecraft designers uh, have to be because they're not betting so much on every one spacecraft. So they can be more adventurous in trying out new technologies. And so between um, um, increasing the number of missions and increasing their adventurousness, there's going to be a tremendous acceleration in the development of spaceflight technology. Space is going to become a cutting edge once again. And furthermore, this has had ramifications outside of space altogether. And I discuss this in the book as well. Okay, Musk, even though he himself is not particularly an advocate of fusion power, okay, he believes solar energy is a thing, okay, he has set off an entrepreneurial race in fusion technology because a number of investors have looked at what's happened in space flight and they said maybe fusion is the same thing as reusable launch vehicles. Maybe the problem of achieving fusion power isn't fundamentally technical but institutional. Maybe if there was an entrepreneurial approach to this that much more creative and much more hard driving uh, companies could be launched, and this job could get done. And now there's five or six fusion power startups that have gotten serious funding. I mean, one of these, uh, Tri-Alpha Energy, has got $500 million of private investment. That's larger than the U.S. government fusion uh, uh, budget. Uh, and, and they're moving. And, you know, I actually, I, I worked a little bit in fusion in Los Alamos in the 80s, and I can remember one lunch where the group leader said to us, look, you know, when fusion power is finally developed, it's not going to be at a place like Los Alamos or Livermore. It's going to be a couple of crackpots working in a garage. And everybody laughed, ha, ha Okay, now, I think that may have been overdrawn. Not a couple of crackpots in a garage, but a startup working in a warehouse, yes. That's who I think is going to develop fusion power. And that's what this has uh, opened up as well. So this has had tremendous ramifications outside of, of, of the space area. Yeah, and there's a lot in the book for our listeners about, if you just read it just for the fusion information, it's, it's really interesting about how that plays into different types of space exploration and missions. I wanted to ask you a few details about the Mars plan. So number one, Buzz Aldrin has this idea to send a ship or a station in solar orbit, but in an orbit such that it approaches Mars and approaches Earth at a periodic rate. What do you think of that in terms of uh, 
furthering the ability to settle Mars? Well, I think we'll have that someday. Uh, I mean, first of all, the idea is technically sound. It can be done. You can put something in a cycling orbit and have it go back and forth. And you can have, therefore, since you only have to launch it once, it could be uh, a large, commodious spacecraft, uh, a virtual space station, if you will. Um, and then you only have to travel to it in relatively small spacecraft, and then you get off of it in a landing craft at Mars and so forth. Um, so this idea has some merit. However, I think it's a second generation idea. It's, you know, the, the frontier was not opened by the railroad. The frontier was opened by pioneers and then by wagon trains. And then once towns were built on, you know, the West Coast, then transcontinental railroad was built. So creating something like this, I believe this will be done. Um, and, um, but I, I view it as something that will be done after there are permanent Mars bases, and it will make supporting them much easier. I gotcha. So one thing I like about your space missions generally is you get around the problem of zero-G simply by spinning things such that there's artificial gravity. So instead of NASA <laughs> shooting people up to the space station for a year period to physically degenerate pretty seriously, um, your idea is just to put some kind of tether on it or some kind of rotate some kind of rotation so you have artificial gravity, which is great. I mean that's part of it, part of this program that really appeals to me. But I had a question about Mars gravity in general, which is roughly a third of that of Earth. It seems like for just a normal adult that would provide no special problems. But I'm curious if there is a Mars settlement, there will be Mars children. And I'm wondering if there's been any study or research about what low G, Mars G, might do in terms of fetal and child development, because obviously that's a concern. And if that, I can, I can imagine how that could be a showstopper, depending on how the biology works out, in terms of full-time settlement. Well, OK, first of all, there's very limited data on partial gravity. OK, in fact, the only data we have on partial gravity is brief visits to the moon by the Apollo astronauts. So that's lunar gravity. It's for a few hours with a few adults. And uh, OK. Now, I actually asked Buzz Aldrin, who had experienced lunar gravity as well as zero gravity and, of course, Earth gravity, whether um, when he was on the moon, whether it felt like more like being on Earth or zero gravity. He said it felt more like being on Earth. Hmm. And that's uh, like, what, a seventh or an eighth? It's one sixth. Okay. And uh, because there's an up, there's a down. You can put a coffee cup on the table. The liquid stays in it. Everything functions. The world operates as it does in uh, one gravity. The, the, uh, the inner ear settles down in, in the way that it does in gravity. So the, 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 um, in other words, the world basically operates that way. And I think that a lot of the... Uh, I mean, there's there's two causes to zero gravity um, health effects. One is the lack of exercise, and the other is um, misfiring of bodily signals, endocrine signals and others, that cause things to go haywire, and also fluids moving around to the wrong part of the body, causing your head to swell up and this and that. Okay, so the second category of things won't happen in partial gravity. Now, of course, the first will to some extent. That is, you don't get the same kind of workout you get walking around in 1G if you're walking around in 1/3 G. And I think that the remedy for that will be exercise, um, both actual work and exercise machines, workout routines, and so forth. Now, in terms, though, of children growing up, there is no data. Now, we had proposed, we, the Mars Society, um, to NASA a spinning uh, um, satellite uh, small, be about a meter in diameter, with a crew of mice, and it would be spinning with the rate that would give them Mars gravity, and you, the ones that were living near the edge, and if they're halfway to the edge, it would give them lunar gravity, and you could see mm. both how adult mice born and raised on Earth developed under those conditions, as well as children born and raised in partial gravity. Um, it got some interest from NASA Ames, which tends to be where the Mavericks and NASA hang out, but at headquarters, absolutely none. They're quite hostile, shut it down. And in fact, this has been a pattern. Uh, NASA's, 
space medicine program has been uh, controlled since its inception by zero-gravity health effects researchers, and they've been very hostile to artificial gravity uh, research. Um, they were uh, against having artificial gravity on the space station. They were in, uh, against experiments with artificial gravity. We could, I mean, one good use for the Orion capsule, I think the Orion capsule is way oversized and overweight for something you'd want to send to the moon, let alone Mars. Um, but as a temporary space station in low Earth orbit, launch an Orion into low Earth orbit, tether it off of the upper stage of the booster that sent it there, spin up that assembly. You can have people living in one-third gravity in Earth orbit in the fairly spacious Orion capsule and have them there for a month, and we could start seeing what the effects of one-third gravity are on people. Um, that, that, that's what I would prefer to do with Orion. Uh, but the... Um, um, uh, but th they, they're against it. Uh, and it kind of reminds me of, um, there's a great book called Scientists Against Time uh, by J. Baxter Finney, and it's about the U.S. Uh, scientific effort in World War II. And it covers everything, the incredible scientific effort. Of course, Manhattan Project, radar, but DDT, penicillin, anti-submarine warfare, proximity fuses, you name it, they worked on it. Well, one of the problems they had to confront was hypoxia. You know, these B-17s start flying above 20,000 feet and pilots are blacking out and, and the planes are crashing without any enemy involvement at all. And uh, what's the problem here? And the, so they bring in the doctors and the doctors are saying, hmm, hypoxia, this is a very interesting medical problem. We need a research problem to program to find a cure for hypoxia. Maybe there's a pill that the pilots could take. Okay, and then the flight mechanics come and says, no, 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 no. All you need is an oxygen mask <laughs> because if you're at 25,000 feet, the atmosphere is one third as thick as sea level, but if it's all oxygen, you've got more oxygen than you do at sea level, so an oxygen mask will do it. And the doctors say, get these mechanics out of this room. This is a medical discussion. This is ridiculous. Okay, and and, and they brought up all sorts of issues. You'd have to bring oxygen tanks. If the bullet opened the oxygen tank, it could cause a fire in the airplane. It's a mechanical system. It could fail. So forth, all these concerns. And for a while, this view pre pre prevailed uh, because the doctors were of a higher social class than the flight mechanics, and, and they had more pull. But after a while, the generals got sick of it and said, get out of here. We're just going to use the oxygen mask. And, and so similarly... I mean, look, we've been researching zero-gravity health effects now for almost 60 years. And, uh, and the idea of finding a cure for zero-gravity as opposed to creating an engineering fix to the problem. Okay, yes, there are problems with rotating a spacecraft, but they are absolutely trivial compared to those creating... Uh, uh, changing human physiology to ad adjust to a condition that we haven't lived in since we left the ocean 400 million years ago. You, I'm sold, so yeah, it sounds yeah. like a great... I would love to see that experiment with the yeah. mice. That sounds like a great idea. So another detail about this. In the book, this isn't Mars specifically. This is generally the development of rockets and mm. lower-cost rocket launches. You talk about the possibility of suborbital not only people transport, but just goods goods transport from one place to another on the Earth. And technically, it seems like this could work very well and be a very, very fast way of transport. But I wonder how big of a potential market there actually is, if maybe you're overestimating that. Because there are companies, one in Denver area, working on supersonic. And I think most people would rather fly supersonic than suborbital, even if it takes a little longer because it was not... <laughs> It's not quite as rough a ride at the beginning. Um, though, of course, some, you know, I would lo love to do the rocket launch at least once. Um, but I don't know about the 50th time, right? At the 50th time, you might want to go to uh, supersonic. So, and then in terms of goods, I mean, shipping is so cheap, just moving it across water. It takes a lot, lot longer. But I'm just wondering if there's actually a market for the suborbital flights that you're hoping for. And if there's not, what does that do in terms of 
driving the development of lower cost rocket launches? All right. Well, first of all, I think that the suborbital transport market is people, not goods. Mm. Uh, I mean, occasionally there's a something that you need to get there in four hours. But most of the time, um, if you can ship something to someone and have it there the next day, that's more than good enough. Uh, and uh, But it's people, okay, who don't want to take the 18-hour flight to Australia. Um, you know, uh, I'm cool with my package taking 18 hours to get to Australia. Um, but me is a different story. And... Um, I mean, how Look, rough how rough is this flight going to be? What I mean, I envision like the Apollo Eleven footage where you're like shaking and it's like super high G. What's what's it really like in terms of the rockets that they'd I, actually be? Using? I think you'll probably pull three Gs or so for a few minutes, uh, but you'll also have half an hour of zero gravity. Which is a big draw. I mean, okay, you know, yes, that'd be awesome. <laughs> it, it it would be awesome, wouldn't it? I mean, look, there are companies right now that are at least for now marketing with some success joy rides in zero gravity for four minutes and you don't actually get to go anywhere. Okay. Uh, what I'm talking about here is anywhere to anywhere, New York to Sydney in less than an hour with a half an hour of it being spent in zero gravity in a capacious cabin, you can get to float around a little bit, get to look out the windows at the stars of space. Okay. And you're actually going somewhere. Now, which means that if you're a high enough level, the company will pay for it. Uh, now, furthermore, what I looked at was um, it's quite interesting that SpaceX is choosing methane oxygen as the propellant for the Starship um, because, and so is uh, um, Blue Origin, and so is even Lockheed Martin on the Vulcan. Methane oxygen. Methane oxygen is an excellent propellant, um, but, and it has two other virtues. One is, yes, you can make it on Mars, which is fundamental to the SpaceX Mars plan, which is a variant of Mars Direct. But also, another key point, it's the cheapest propellant mm. by far. Now, with expendable launch vehicles, it hardly matters whether your propellant costs 10 cents a gallon or $100 a gallon, okay, because it's still tiny compared to the cost of the hardware you're throwing away. Once you're introducing reusable rockets, then the cost of fuel matters. Once you're talking about transport, place to place on Earth, it matters. Okay, Fuel costs are a major portion of the airline budget. Um, now, here's the thing. Um, last year, there were about 100 satellite launches in the world. SpaceX got a quarter of them, which is kind of amazing uh, for a single, relatively small company. You get a quarter of the whole world market, especially since about half of the world market was off limits for an American company anyway, because it's Russian or Chinese or something. Okay. Um, but, and now that they're cheapening space launch, maybe we'll see 200 satellite launchers a year, maybe 300. But that's still tiny and if if you are running a company and you have to have this whole large technical staff to support your space launch systems it definitely well that could support the, the a larger market could support another factor of two or three or five reduction in launch cost what about a factor of a hundred which is what we would really like to see okay that needs hundreds of times the number of launches um well there may be only 100 satellite launches per year. Um, there's hundreds of intercontinental airline flights every hour. Um, and if you can get part of that market. And I worked the numbers on using something like the SpaceX Starship for intercontinental travel. And um, I was coming up with um, um, th that the budget closes at passenger prices on the order of $20,000 a seat. Now, that's what people pay right now for first class New York to Sydney. Hmm. Uh, so there's a certain number of people doing that right now. And what are they getting? A bigger seat, a tablecloth, and a free drink. Uh, they're still spending 18 hours in the airplane. Here, now you're actually getting there in an hour, maybe two, counting the ride to and from the airport. And um, 
I believe that there are business executives, among others, um, if they have a meeting and the meeting is today, uh, say, I'm going this way and the company will pay for it. And so now you're talking about a launch market of tens of thousands of flight per year instead of hundreds per year. And this will cause a massive drop in the cost of uh, all sorts of space hardware, especially launch vehicles. And furthermore, these same vehicles that could get to New York to Sydney in an hour, if you wanted to, it could just stay on orbit. Um, and now if you want to spend a day in space, a day tour, fine. So now you can have, you know, five-hour, six-hour, 12-hour space uh, trips for day tourists. Now, if you want to spend a week, it doesn't make sense to leave such a transport up in space for a week because it could be making money by flying every day. So now you actually have the possibility of the space hotels. I mean, when Bigelow first introduced his idea of the space hotel in the 90s, he was um, excessively ahead of his time. There was no launch vehicle that could uh, give him customers. Um, but soon there will be. So I want to switch gears. Thank you for that. I want to switch gears just a bit. I want to talk about Jeff Bezos' recent address, which you can find on YouTube. For listeners, it's called Going to Space to Benefit Earth from May 9th. And I want to play a bit of devil's advocate while I'm at it. So I don't know if you've watched the address. It's, on, it's online. So Bezos, it turns out, and you talk about this in your, in your book, actually went to Princeton and got into the science uh, programs through Princeton. And I don't know if he studied with, but at least met O'Neill, yes. who vision yes, he's very much recruited to the O'Neill vision. Right, and so he talks about the O'Neill colonies a lot in in uh, in his presentation, which is basically for listeners is basically a giant tube which rotates, and you put people or whatever you want on half of it so that you have artificial gravity. <clears throat> now, but so he seems to be based on that presentation. He seems to be not nearly as enthusiastic about. Mars, or even the moon, uh, at least as you do, he seems to be much more enthusiastic about building these O'Neill colonies. And he runs this old clip of Isaac Asimov, and somebody asked Isaac, well, why, why didn't you write more of these O'Neill colony type of structures into your books? And he's, his answer was, well, I guess I was a planet chauvinist. And so I want to ask you, Robert Zubrin, are you, now you talk about stations and such, but your emphasis is Mars which you've sold me on. But are we wrong? Are you wrong? Are you, should the emphasis be these colonies? Are you a planet chauvinist? I'm a planet firster. <laughs> um, I believe it's a lot easier to settle a planet than to build one. Um, the, uh, now, there's a place in my vision for O'Neill colonies, but it's well into the future, um, uh, well beyond um, the settling of Mars. Um, I mean, these sorts of things one could envision as interstellar arcs for interstellar travel. These could be city-states built in the asteroid belt for um, groups of people who want to establish their own culture with their own ideas and have a place where they can go and, yes, build an O'Neill colony out of an asteroid. But the idea of moving these things into Earth orbit, I mean, you're talking about billions of tons. I mean, the worst NASA Mars mission I've ever seen is thousands of tons. Uh, and uh, so you're talking about something a million times more massive than the extremely badly designed Mars mission would be. And the, 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 so this is, I mean, a factor of a million is, is significant <laughs> increase in difficulty. So now, you know, we probably move a million times more goods uh, around the world today than they did 500 years ago. Um, but this is, uh, and, and maybe progress can be faster than it has been over the past 500 years because the rate has been picking up over the last two. Um, but still, you're talking about something that is uh, well beyond. So I, I think that, um, I mean, Gerard O'Neill certainly inspired a lot of people with his vision of space settlement. But I think that from a technical point of view, it was not um, correct. Um, the, I think that the idea of beaming electricity down from space to pay for building space colonies 
um, uh, is uh, not valid uh, because uh, electricity is a common commodity. To the consumer, a kilowatt's a kilowatt. If it comes out of the plug, I don't care whether it has come from nuclear power, solar energy, coal, natural gas, a waterfall, or a windmill, or a space colony. Okay, so the only question for me is, is it reliable, is it cheap? Okay, now, uh, a, a solar panel on orbit, at most, you're going to see... Um, a factor of, of, of uh, four more energy generated by it than one I put on the ground in Arizona. And, uh, and I lose half of that in the beaming process. So that's a factor of two. And if you look at all the extra costs required to put this up there and, and, and all of that compared to just putting it on the ground in Arizona, it's not competitive with that. Let, and, and, and the solar panel on the ground in Arizona is yet to be competitive with a natural gas-fired power plant, um, or even a windmill for that matter. And the, the, so I think that for a commodity in space to sell on Earth, it has to have special qualities. Um, that, uh, in other words, you, you're not going to import highway paving stones from the moon. You could, but w why would you do that? Uh, now, I think uh, th there are products that could be made in space. Well, of course, there are material objects. Helium-3 is not available on Earth, so conceivably you could import that from space. But I think that the, the most important products to import from space won't be material objects at all. I think they'll be intellectual products. Um, I think they'll be inventions that space colonists make. For instance, Martian colonists uh, uh, coming up with ideas in robotics and artificial intelligence and genetically modified organisms and, and perhaps fusion power um, to meet their own needs that these inventions developed in a frontier culture dedicated to invention, that these inventions can be licensed on Earth. These are what will improve license on Earth and these are what is going to bring revenue to space. That makes sense to me. You can convince you can convince Jeff next time you have dinner with him. Yes. <laughs> so to switch gears, <clears throat> you ha also have you call your moon plan Moon Direct to parallel the Mars Direct plan. Could you briefly summarize what you think we should be doing with the moon? And you say we should go simultaneously to the moon and Mars, or at least could, versus the boondoggle version of the moon version moon moon mission, which you are not <laughs> obviously not a fan of. Right. Well, the, the problem with um, the current moon program is it's a vendor-driven program. It's not a purpose-driven program. Uh, it seeks to maximize costs. It seeks to provide something to do for the most expensive systems available, the SLS and the Orion. And um, the, the uh, and I mean, it's, and, and the problem is, is that, the, well, the Orion in particular is inappropriate because it's so heavy. It, at 26 tons, in comparison to the Apollo capsule that weighed nine tons, or the dragon that weighs 10 and was 50 is 50 percent larger than the Apollo capsule. Okay, this is 26. It's so heavy that even the SLS can't deliver it into low lunar orbit with enough propellant for it to come home. And so now they're talking about building a halfway house space station in high lunar orbit because we can get it there and it come home with an SLS launch, and now you need another SLS launch to deliver a lander to the gateway, so-called, and then they rendezvous there, and the astronauts could go from there to the surface and then back to the moon. And now you need two SLS launches per lunar mission, um, and they have to be done within a short time of each other, so it's not only incredibly expensive, it might not even be feasible. And the, the because the SLS has got a projected launch rate of about one a year, um, and to do this mission, you'd have to do two within a short time of each other. So this is designing for failure. Now, one obvious fix would be to use the Dragon instead of the Orion. SLS would be able to deliver a Dragon into low lunar orbit with enough fuel for it to come home. In fact, Falcon Heavy could, which is one-tenth the cost of an SLS. Uh, so, wow. Okay, yes, using the Dragon would make it possible, and using Falcon Heavy would make it cheap. But one could go beyond that um, and uh, say, is this even the correct architecture? 
uh, that is the correct overall scheme. The architecture is more or less copied from Apollo, the so-called lunar orbit rendezvous approach. And lunar orbit rendezvous approach is workable, and it, in fact, it was enabling for Apollo, but it's not the correct approach for a lunar base program. Okay, if you have a lunar base, uh, you don't want to have somebody uh, floating around in lunar orbit doing nothing but soaking up cosmic rays while you're spending long duration uh, missions on the moon. It was fine for Apollo to have Mike Collins up there for a day while they're kicking up some dust on the moon. But do you want to have someone up there for months uh, doing that and not really contributing to the surface exploration? And furthermore, the prime motive for the lunar orbit rendezvous was to stage the return propellant in lunar orbit and thereby save some mass. But if you have a base and you're making propellant on the surface of the moon, it no longer saves mass to stage propellant from Earth in lunar orbit. It saves mass to come back direct from the surface of the moon. And furthermore, by coming back direct from the surface of the moon, you eliminate a liability. You eliminate the need for a mission-critical lunar orbit rendezvous on the return leg. You eliminate the need for an entire spacecraft that has to be left in lunar orbit, okay? And furthermore, your launch window to Earth is always open because from the surface of, of the moon looking up at the Earth, it's always in the exact same place in the sky. And so you can always take off and fly home as opposed to have to time your return with a lunar orbit, low lunar orbit spacecraft in a two-hour orbit, let alone a lunar orbit gateway in an 11-day orbit. I mean, here's a bus that comes by every 11 days. If you miss it, you're out of luck. Um, it, it, so now you can fly directly home. Now, the key to making that the most desirable plan is to make your propellant on the moon, but that's why they're saying we're going there. They're going to the south pole of the moon because that's where the craters are that have the ice in them, which you could make into hydrogen oxygen. So the ideal lunar orbit, excuse me, the ideal lunar base program is one that, yes, is a base of the south pole, where the base is in the highlands, which are permanently in sunlight, near the craters that are in permanent darkness. They mine the water, they bring it to the base, they turn into propellant. And then your mission plan is you have a lunar excursion vehicle, uh, which has a delta V capability of six kilometers a second. Now, six kilometers a second would take you up and down to the gateway and back, but why bother? Because six kilometers a second will take it from the lunar surface all the way to LEO and propulsively capture in low Earth orbit without any need to go to a gateway. And then your capsule, instead of having to be sent to a gateway in orbit around the moon, could just be sent to low Earth orbit. And so now the recurring mission can be done with a single launch, not even of a Falcon Heavy, but of a Falcon 9, sending the astronauts to low Earth orbit in a Dragon, along with perhaps six tons of propellant to refuel the lunar excursion vehicle and send it back to the moon base. Refuels on the moon, comes back to low Earth orbit. Okay. Furthermore, this vehicle fueled at the lunar base, enough propellant for six kilometers a second, it could fly thousands of kilometers out from the base, land at faraway places on the moon, allow exploration there, and return to the base. So now the base is a true base. It actually supports lunar exploration. And, you know, you might want to use your heaviest vehicle, SLS, if you've got it, uh, provided you gave it a proper upper stage, which unfortunately they're not doing, to deliver your initial base payloads to the lunar surface, to deliver some HAB modules to the lunar surface, a couple houses delivered to the moon, and even deliver the fully fueled lunar excursion vehicle to the moon with the astronauts in the period before you have lunar propellant making operational. But once lunar propellant making is operational, we don't want to need to use SLS to support lunar operations. If we have it, and if Starship is not yet introduced, it, as our heaviest uh, artillery, should be redirected towards Mars. In other words, the idea is not to design a lunar base that has the, the most and perpetual need for the SLS. It's to design it to have the least need for it so that you can use your heaviest capabilities to go for more ambitious objectives as soon as the heavy work is done. It's like... You know, we sent our best combat units to take the Normandy beachhead, okay? But after the beachhead was taken, it can be managed by rear echelon units, and the best combat units has got to go liberate the rest of France, okay? And that's um, uh, how we should do space as well. I think you call the gateway a toll booth in the book, which I thought yes, was Yes, lunar orbit toll booth. A, a, a little detour here. 
so you solve some of the problem of cosmic radiation just by not leaving, <laughs> leaving people up there as long. But for long distance trips, it becomes more of a, more of an issue and the more of an issue, the longer distance and the more, or at least the more time it takes. Is there anything to do the localized electromagnetic field, anything that's under development or conceived that might reduce or mitigate or solve this problem? Well, there's two kinds of radiation that can get you in interplanetary space. There's cosmic rays and there's solar flares. Solar flares are big radiation events that last for a few hours that happen about once a year on an unpredictable basis. Okay. Um, and they can deliver a fatal radiation dose in the course of a few hours. But the kind of radiation that they are made of are protons with energies on the order of a million volts, and they can be stopped by like five inches of water. So we can make a shelter on the ship out of the provisions. Solar flare happens, the alarm bell rings, you go in the shelter, stay there a few hours, you come out when the all clear rings. That's the solar flare. Cosmic rays don't come in a big rush once in a while. They come as a constant little pitter-patter of very high-energy radiation coming in from interstellar space. And they have energies not of a million volts per particle, but a billion volts per particle. So you can't stop it with five inches of water. It would take meters of water to stop the cosmic rays. And we don't have enough mass on the ship. So you're going to take that dose. But the dose isn't that big. Okay, It's around 50 rem for every year you're in interplanetary space. Um, and we're going to be in space for a year on this mission. We're six months out, six months back, year and a half on the surface. On the surface, we have all the mass we need for shielding. So you're going to get your 50 rem over, scattered actually over a two and a half year period. Now, that is the same radiation dose from cosmic rays as Scott Kelly just got, spent, and Peggy Whitson just got, spending a year on the space station because the cosmic ray radiation dose on the space station is one half that of interplanetary space. The Earth's magnetic field does not block out cosmic rays. Okay, it, uh, The Earth blocks out cosmic rays, so the Earth is under you. It blocks out half the sky. The rest of the sky gets you. And uh, there are actually about a dozen astronauts and cosmonauts who have gotten radiation doses on this scale due to extended stays on the space station or the Mir. And we've seen no radiological casualties uh, among this group. Uh, based on the extremely conservative uh, linear no threshold hypothesis, which says that a very small radiation dose carries a proportionate fraction of risk of a large radiation dose, which is something, for instance, we do not see with alcohol toxicity, for example. But if we accept that, um, it, this 50 rem represents about a 1% risk of getting a fatal cancer at some point later in your life. That's a small part of overall mission risk. Um, that's much less than the risk um, of smoking. It's even less than the risk of living in Houston where there's uh, uh, chemical fumes in the atmosphere. Uh, from the petrochemical industry. Um, so actually, if, if we sent astronauts to Mars, uh, we would be reducing their risk of getting cancer, even if they don't smoke, let alone those that do. Okay, so to summarize, <laughs> zero-G is a serious problem which we can fix. Which they're not addressing. Right. Cosmic rays is a minor problem which we can't fix, but we just have to live with it. Correct. So I'd like to spend, we've been in about an hour here, I'd like to spend a few minutes covering what's basically the last third or so of your book, which is, why should we do this? Why does this matter? Why should we do this? What is this going to bring us? And so I, my three, you write, you, have, you cover quite a bit there, but to me the big things are discovery, possible discovery of life, or if we don't discover life, that's also meaningful. The security of, our, of the human race from asteroids, and I would add us blowing each other up with nuclear wars, warheads or whatever, and the importance of having an open frontier. So, I don't know, how, do you want to just go All right, those? so I discuss those uh, in a number of chapters for uh, the knowledge, for uh, our survival, for the challenge, and uh, for our freedom. Um, Okay, for the knowledge, this is the one that NASA is aware of. Um, and uh, I must say that uh, while I am quite critical of the way the human spaceflight program is being run, 
Uh, I have very strong applause for the way the NASA Science Directorate is run, the Planetary Exploration Group and the Space Astronomy Group. Um, uh, you know, one can argue about various decisions, but these remain purpose-driven uh, programs, not vendor-driven programs, and their accomplishments accordingly have been epic. Um, but once we get uh, cheaper access to space, their accomplishments are going to multiply. Um, and uh, yes, there's the question of the discovery of life on Mars, which is the key to letting us know whether the development of life is a general phenomenon uh, that occurs wherever you have a planet with the right physical and chemical conditions, because the early Mars was very similar to the early Earth. And if life evolved here is naturally emergent from chemistry, it should have occurred there. And if we can go there, do some fossil hunting, and find the fossils of the first life on Mars, uh, we'll have proven this. If we can drill down into the ground where the survivors may still be, because there is underground water on Mars, where it could um, be refuges for life that initially was at the surface and then had to go below as the surface became uh, inclement, um, we'd find out if life as it evolves elsewhere is um, what we see on Earth with DNA and RNA and all of that, or whether it uses a different alphabet and a different language and a different method of operation altogether. Um, or in other words, is life as we know it on Earth what life is, or is it just one example of life? Or are that, we Martians? Yeah. Well, of course, we could have come from there as well. But but there's also other discoveries to made in space. I mean, you, people need to understand that most of our great discoveries in physics have actually come from astronomy. The laws of gravitation and classical physics were discovered through astronomy. Okay. Uh, the substantial part of the discovery of electromagnetism was done through astronomy. Uh, relativity was discovered through astronomy and confirmed through astronomy. Nuclear fusion was discovered through astronomy. Okay, and the the uh, and the fifth fourth of nature uh, and, and dark matter and so forth obviously discovered through astronomy. And the reason why these great discoveries in physics have been made through astronomy is because the universe provides a laboratory far more extensive and powerful than anything we could build ourselves. Okay. And there are great gaps in our knowledge of physics. Our knowledge of physics right now is incoherent. And it's not merely incoherent in the way that physicists frequently point out that the quantum mechanics and gra gra in general relativity are, are not coherent with each other and they need to be unified. There's things in f our knowledge of physics that just make no sense at all. Why don't electrons blow themselves to pieces like charges repel? Okay, why is there matter at all? Okay, why is there time? I mean, why, uh, you know, our, our basic uh, science, you learn, matter, energy, while they can be interchanged with each other, cannot be created or destroyed. Well, here it is. How was it created? How was matter created? We don't understand fundamental physics. We've only read the first book, the first chapter of the book of science. There's much more discoveries waiting to be made, and we're going to make them by going out and having a look. Okay, uh, So um, we don't know why the laws of physics are friendly to life. This is not... Uh, Understood. And, and the dodges that are offered, well, if they weren't, you wouldn't be asking that question. You could answer any question that way. Why did the chicken cross the road? If it hadn't, you wouldn't ask why it did. Why the Allies win World War II? If they hadn't, you wouldn't be asked why they did. Okay, this is uh, not a real answer. Uh, you know, well, the laws of the universe are friendly to life because there's an infinite number of universes, and in this one, it just happens to be the one where they are friendly to life. Why did the chicken cross the road? In a million other universes, it didn't. Why did the allies win World War II? In a million other... No, the, these are not scientific answers. Um, the, the, these these are, are philosophical games. There is a reason why the chicken crossed the road, and there is a reason why the Allies won World War II, and there is a reason why the laws of the universe are friendly to life, and we don't know it yet. Okay, um, and it's a, a, a very valid question. So the knowledge, okay, survival, asteroids. Okay, people know the dinosaurs bought it from the asteroids, and there's been impacts ever since. In fact. Uh, 
I'm not a religious person, and I'm not into trying to justify the Bible through naturalistic explanations, but it is a fact that Israeli archaeologists excavating Sodom and Gomorrah have found evidence of a meteor impact about 1,000 B.C. So that, that, so that account appears to be an account of an impact. Uh, and, the, um, and we had a little impact December 18th of last year in the Bering Sea with a force, an energy release 10 times that of the Hiroshima bomb. So this isn't even, you know, about dinosaurs or ancient human history. This stuff is happening. And, uh, and what, what? I don't agree with these people who say, oh, we have to go to space so we can have some survivors if the Earth is destroyed by an asteroid impact. I think that's uh, uh, ridiculous. The, 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 we go to space so we have control over our environment so we can prevent asteroid impacts. The Earth is in space, okay? And there are things moving around in space, and they hit each other, including the Earth. And if we want to control our environment, which is space, to protect the Earth, so we don't... We need to do that. In other words, we don't go to space to desert the Earth. We go to space to protect the Earth. And we go to space to create allies for the Earth, i.e. Mars. It's together to Mars and then together with Mars. Okay, Martian civilization is not set up to be ha a place for some survivors of the destroyed Earth. Martian civilization is set up to have a new productive branch of human civilization that can do its bit towards contributing to the advance of humanity um, to, in all respects, including its ability to survive. Um, okay, so that is that. Now, then there's... Um, and I was just, I was struck by, I didn't realize... The, the number of objects we predict exists is a lot larger than the number of objects we've actually identified. So there's a lot of stuff going on that we just don't know about out there. Right. And so it's easy to kind of keep our heads buried in the sand and ignore it. But realistically, there's, there's a lot that things could go very, very badly. Right. Now then, there's the challenge. Now, challenge is useful. Civilizations are grow like individuals. We grow when we challenge ourselves. We stagnate when we don't. Uh, and we've seen the influence, the positive influence of a bold space program on our own culture, particularly in the 60s when the Apollo program sparked a doubling of science graduates because youth loves adventure. Apollo made space the great adventure. Uh, millions went into science, and we've benefited from that intellectual capital ever since. But there's a more general point. I mean, I think cultures need challenge, and we need a more healthy challenge than war with each other because serious wars that could actually challenge us have become so dangerous that that is not the road forward at all. Okay, we want a different kind of challenge, a challenge offered by an open frontier. And you think of the Martian frontier, for example, new place with new challenges, populated largely by technologically adept people in an environment where they're being forced to innovate and where they're free to innovate and they're going to innovate. And this is how the American frontier functioned. Okay, we had a very serious labor shortage on the American frontier, so we were driven to create labor-saving machinery. We were also to cre driven into forms of social liberation. Okay, uh, uh, black people freed from slavery had their best chance to enter society as fully equal people on the frontier, certainly not in the South or even in the North. Women first became school teachers on the frontier. First real profession opened up to women on the frontier because there was a shortage of qualified people. And if a girl could read and cipher and read some books, you teach the kids. Uh, and then that propagated eastward during the labor shortage caused by the Civil War. Uh, and of course, women first got the vote in the frontier states, Utah, Wyoming, so forth, long before it became a national thing. So uh, challenge is liberating. And I think that having places where people can go, where they are challenged, and moreover, where they are less regulated, where the practical necessities makes it uh, 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 
increasingly obvious that we have to use every talent that people have and don't block them from using it through regulations. Oh, we can't have you fix rovers until you have a certificate from a two-year training class. If you can actually fix the rover, fix the rover. Uh, the, 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 uh, and I think that this kind of pragmatic um, culture, which, you know, uh, by comparison with other cultures, this is the stereotype of Americans. Pragmatists do not respect tradition, do not respect uh, the way it has been done. If it's a practical way to do it, let's do it that way. This will be that to the nth power. Okay? And these new societies, whether we're talking about technical innovations or whether we're talking about societal innovations, uh, if they are good ideas, they will be shown to be good by their success, and these examples will then be emulated. And this is how having an open frontier can help progress overall. And then finally, there's another issue, which I discuss in this book. And I think this is very important, um, and it, it's not generally discussed. Um, it is this that the greatest threat to humanity today does not come from asteroid impact. It does not come from global warming. It does not come from resource exhaustion. It comes from bad ideas. And um, all the great human-caused disasters of the 20th century, all the, which were all the great disasters of the 20th century, uh, like World War I and World War II and the Holocaust and the Holodomor were all caused by bad ideas, and in particular by variants of a single bad idea, which is that there isn't enough for everyone. Okay, so we have got to get rid of those other people over there. And as soon as you accept that as being axiomatic, that there isn't going to be enough to, for everyone, maybe there's enough now, but sooner or later is not going to be enough for everyone, so we have to get rid of them over there, then the only issue is when. Is it in time in our favor or is time in their favor? And, you know, in 1912, General Ferdinand Bernhardi, chief intellectual of the German general staff, wrote a book called in English anyway, Germany in the Next War. It was a bestseller. It was a, sooner or later, we're going to have to have it out with Russia. Better sooner than later, so we can take them out before they industrialize. Okay? And so two years later, they take advantage of the assassination of the Archduke to launch World War I. And then Hitler, even more hysterically, Germany needs living space. The laws of existence require uninterrupted killing so that the better may live. It was all pure nonsense. Pure nonsense. Germany never needed living space. Germany today is much smaller than the Third Reich. It has a larger population and a vastly higher standard of living. Why? Because of technical innovations that have been done by the entire human race, including, yes, Germany, but also, yes, Russians and Americans and Brits and French, and, and if we go back further in time, Chinese. And the, 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 uh, that the real situation of humanity is not of races in a struggle for existence or nations in a struggle for existence, but of um, different groups of people acting in a uh, competitively but nevertheless cooperatively in a joint venture to expand the human prospect. Um, this is why as the population of the world has gone up, the standard of living has gone up, not down, as the Malthusians would predict. Okay, but nevertheless, so long as humanity appears to be confined to the earth, this thesis that there's only so much to go around appears to be self-evidently true. And it's an extremely dangerous idea. I happen to know because I have talked to them, that there are people in Washington in positions of influence in our national security establishment who believe that war with China is ultimately inevitable because if the Chinese with their 1.3 billion people actually develop and so they all have cars like we do, there isn't going to be enough oil in the world. Okay? And you can bet your bottom dollar that there are people in Beijing and Moscow looking at the chessboard from the other side of the table who think pretty much the same thing about us. Okay? And if these ideas are allowed to prevail, there will be World War III. There will be, because it, there's no two ways about it, especially if they become convinced that 
one point or another, it's to our advantage to do this now rather than later. And ultimately, by definition, it's to one side or the other's advantage to do it sooner rather than later. Okay, so there you have it. You're skating on thin ice. But space subverts, can destroy this viewpoint, okay? Because it makes it clear that there isn't just so much to go around because the Earth comes with an infinite sky. And the issue here is not we're going to bring back oil from Mars. Okay, that's not my position. I don't even believe we're going to bring back solar energy from space, beaming it down the way the O'Neillians argue. I think that that is untrue too. It's a question not of bringing back things from space. It's the question of bringing back truth from space. And the fundamental truth is that we are allies. The fundamental truth is that working together, we can open up new worlds, infinite frontiers, infinite possibilities, advancing the human prospect together. And that ultimately is the case for space. Well, the first vision is terrifying, and your alternate vision is very inspiring. So thank you for writing the book. Tell listeners how to follow your work in the Mars Society, too. Okay. Well, um, people can... Um, uh, the Mars Society has a website, which is at marssociety.org, and you can go there. You can sign up free for our newsletters. You can. I hope you will join the Mars Society. It's like $50 dues per year, or half that if you're a student. We have a conference, uh, which everyone is invited to. This year, it's going to be October 17th through 20th at the University of Southern California. And if you would like to present at this conference, there's currently an open call for papers, which is posted at marsociety.org. Send in an abstract of 300 words, and you could well be selected to present your paper at the conference. And the papers can be anything dealing with Mars exploration or colonization, anything from an instrument to use on the next robotic mission, to how to do a manned mission, to how to terraform Mars, to how to finance Mars missions, anything, okay? Um, you know, if, if it's of interest to, uh, you know, the Martian future, nothing uh, uh, human is foreign to us. Well, thank you. I don't want to jinx this, but I do hope that there is a Zubrin city on Mars and right. in, the, in the not too distant future. So thanks a lot for sharing with us today. I appreciate the work in the book. All right. Well, thank you.